Hello and welcome everyone from wherever in the world you're joining us from. Kia ora, ola, ni hao, ciao and salam. It has been a hard few weeks for the world and we've got tougher times yet still ahead of us. But the one thing that has been a shining light through all of this has been quarantine culture. We've all been tucked up in home, at home, entertained by Italians singing opera from their balconies, by London DJs, I imagine, annoying their neighbours, and some genius mother who swapped pocket money for toilet paper squares to get her kids to do their chores. This global experience re really does create the feeling that we're all in this together. A number of visitor attractions have joined in on the effort and stolen our hearts with the cutest and coolest digital campaigns to keep their audiences engaged online while their physical doors are closed. Joining us here today are the brains behind three of those venues whose campaigns have gone viral, earning them star status, a mass following and global media coverage. We're going to hear about Wellington the Penguin and his friends from and Andrea Rogers, Vice President Public Relations and External Affairs at Shed Aquarium. Next door in Chicago, Catherine Urich, Social mm. Media Manager at the Field Museum, will share with us the lockdown antics of everyone's favourite dino, Sue the T-Rex, and then Grace Peacock will melt our hearts with the cutest coverage of kids enjoying roller coasters in their living rooms. Today's webinar will be recorded and slides distributed afterwards. Do feel welcome to say hello using the all panelists and attendees functions and share your thoughts as we go. There's also a Q&A section to ask questions. We'll be answering a bunch of those towards the end of today's session. So please feel welcome to add yours in there too. And with that, I will leave you with Andrea. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for inviting Shed Aquarium to be a part of today's webinar. Um, if we move to the next slide, I just want to begin by saying is that mission drives everything. It drives everything that we do. And let me uh, give you a little introduction to our organization. And that is that Shed Aquarium uh, is uh, situated on the beautiful lakefront, Lake Michigan in Chicago. We have 32,000 animals in our care that represent 1,500 different species. And since we opened our doors in 1930, we have really had the privilege of welcoming 280 million guests and really giving them the opportunity to look nature in the eye. So today, however, we welcome about approximately 2 million guests annually. And we're really showing them the amazing aquatic world that lives beneath the water line. Our job, we really see, is to be able to peel back that surface, you know, both on site to show them what lies beneath through immersive and participatory experiences, and then also online digitally in ways that are personally relevant, but also allow learning to persist beyond a visit and oftentimes autonomous of one. If we go to the next slide, um, I was asked to share just a little bit about our multi-channel engagement right now. So um, first and foremost, we are living in an age where nearly 1 million species are at the risk of extinction. And we know that children are spending less than half the amount of time outdoors than they did 20 years ago. So our mission is incredibly important right now and has never been more urgent. And so what that means is that when we physically close our doors, that means that we are just going to pour our mission into larger digital ones. So what you're seeing on the screen um, are a number of different ways in which we are doing that. So we're focusing on our social platforms and Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are really leveraging web-based video, both on our website and through our YouTube channel, and then also our email platforms in a number of different ways, talking to donors and members, allowing our president and CEO to speak directly to our supporters uh, and the public. Um, but today, I know we're going to be focusing a lot more on our penguins and what that strategy looks like, but I did want to take a moment to pause because I was asked is that, you know, as organizations are really trying to understand right now, what's next? What should we be doing? Should we create a VR experience or should we create an app or launch X, Y, and Z? I do want to set the reminder of uh, don't underestimate the age-old uh, adage of 
what once was old is new again. Because as all of these new consumers are starting to become familiar with your brand in new and different ways and new audiences are getting to know you, a lot of the materials that you have already done are extremely beneficial and useful. So without having to create anything, uh, you may only need to resurface and repackage those things. So you can see on the screen a couple of different examples of those. Um, nothing is more true than our Sea Curious series, which was designed for young uh, early learners. And that alone has seen 23 times more video views than the same period last year. Our Keep Shark Swimming 360 videos, 18 times more views. And then you can also see our Underwater Beauty Live webcam, also 14 times more views than the same uh, period of time last year. And all of these assets are now at least two years old. And we're just bringing them back to the surface and allowing uh, the public to engage with them again in different ways. If we move to the next slide, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about our content creation at SHED, which is extremely collaborative. Um, so let me say that uh, it was Friday, March 16th, when we first made the decision voluntarily to close our doors for two weeks, obviously in the best interest of um, preventing the further spread of the virus. One hour later, we had 30 people in the room. And that is what I wanna say is that it begins with collaboration, that this does not just exist within the public relations team, the social media team, the marketing team, everybody is at the table. And I think one of the things that makes our organization unique, obviously, is our animals. We have a living collection and people are extremely passionate about that. And so um, it's no doubt that uh, animals are number one always. One of our uh, leading tenants within Shed's experiential brand is to lead with animals. And so you will always see that come through. Um, we also knew as we started that conversation that one of the biggest things as we announced our closure that we would expect for people is they are wondering, well, what is happening to the animals while you're closed? So who's taking care of them? What are they doing? How is it different? So one of the core content motivations of that collective planning team, of course, is to ensure the public's continued trust and visibility that world-class animal care and welfare is still being upheld. And then we also did a full sweep of all of the other organizational needs. How do we need to pivot our current member acquisition and fundraising efforts? How do we keep delivering on learning outcomes when our formal institutions are no longer in school? So how do we keep people learning without them even knowing they're really doing it because we're doing it in a very experiential way? Um, we do it through empowering our partner teams and working together. And so to that next point, I just wanna talk about who's at that table. That is our veterinarians at the table talking about what surgeries were already scheduled, what checkups are already going on. It's our marine mammals team, our fishes team, our conservation biologists. They're all part of that process. But then very quickly, we are putting in place a new system, a very streamlined, centralized way to collect all of these rich stories, what's going on, assets. We are empowering our animals teams to be the videographers. Show us what you're doing on site. What are the animals up to? Drop it in this massive centralized space so we can take a look and evaluate and see what's going on. And then really kind of at the end of that uh, planning period, it was really clear that four primary story arcs were starting to emerge. And that was bringing just emotional recess for folks, bringing guests closer and deeper to our animals and our mission. What are the informal educational offerings and activities that we can provide during this time? And then of course, the necessary operational updates, not just our hours and program cancellations and things like that, but also being an incredibly good civic partner. What does the city need from us and, and to introduce our fans and followers at this time? What does the state need from us? So if we move to the next slide, we'll talk about Wellington and how all of this uh, came about. So it was Friday, March 13th, we closed our doors, Sunday morning, via an email to the, ex, uh, to the uh, executive leadership team came this brilliant video that was shared by our chief animal operations officer. One of our um, marine mammal staff members, uh, caretakers, uh, shot the video. And uh, it was an email that said, here's, 
a great example of some things going on, what we're gonna uh, try to provide and capture. And as soon as we saw that video, we said, yes, this is exactly what we're talking about. And it took a few minutes to kick that out to the PR team and the social team for them to rally around, get more information and get it up and posted on our platform. So the social media team did an incredibly nimble, quick job of getting that up. But then we paired that with our public relations team and the earned media effort to amplify our channels. And so all of the assets that we are uh, pushing out to our digital fans and followers, we are also pushing to news desks and the digital editors of those news desks as well. And I think that has proven to be incredibly successful. So we're closed on the 16th, on the 15th we have a video and March 16th we're viral. Okay, so let's go to the next um, slide. And so that Wellington video really originated first as a way of showing What's going on? How are the animals continue, uh, continuing to be enriched? You know, these are things that, uh, that we do day in and day out, but now there's a massive geography that's not being used throughout the aquarium. Give them some, some choice, some new things, some new exploration. So a video that really started with that intent then um, became something completely different. And it, it became something completely different because we were listening and responding to what people were saying to us. And so uh, it evolved from what's going on at the aquarium to penguins as ambassadors of curiosity and exploration. So they are the ones that are looking nature in the eye and we are experiencing it with them. And there is just something wonderful about wonder. And I think that has really been the success uh, behind uh, our ability to keep people engaged and following in this way. Um, you can see on the screen, I've also shared a couple of our own performance stats here. It has been in in incredibly amazing. You know, our, uh, our followings, our engagement rates, everything is through the roof. And I think through, um, in a little bit through Q&A, we can provide some additional um, stats and metrics there. But I think um, one of the also meaningful things is uh, what we are hearing. I think it's great. In our comments. And that is that a lot more direct messages. That's great. Requesting specific content um, like, uh, Penguins and otters playing, it was kind of really rare for us before to get anything via direct message. Um, many of the comments we're receiving um, go beyond the cute factor, right? It is literally um, gratitude. People saying this content is keeping us sane. Please keep it coming. Thank you, thank you for what you're doing. And then I would say the other part is that we're also getting comments of how this is being used um, as educational. So for instance, we have a fan in Spain that reached out and said that our posts, they are taking them and using them for educational materials for their family and their kids and their students and things like that. So that has been fantastic to see. Go to the next slide. I also just wanna share the stats in which earned media to amplify our own channels has also been extremely successful. This is just our stats since March 13th from an earned standpoint. And so not only is earned media amplifying social, but social is amplifying earned coverage and really highlighting that. And essentially what's happening is our penguins have become influencers in some way. And so we're seeing uh, media have a lot of fun with it. We're seeing that we are part of stories uh, that are ways in which we are helping the, uh, the public to cope. We're seeing a lot of consumer generated artwork and spoofs and spin-offs. That's, uh, that's really funny to see. But also I think what's really meaningful is we're also um, scaffolding together with brands. So both locally, Field, you'll hear a little bit about it, Lyric Opera, Harris Theater, and then also nationally. Um, you may have seen a lot of puppies running through our colleagues, uh, Georgia Aquarium down there. And so, um, I think the bottom line is that there is room for everyone and what brings respite and what connects people to the natural world right now has be, really been um, refreshing and amazing to see. And then lastly, um, I was asked to share a little bit about challenges, right, and pivots that we're making. These graphics say it all, social distancing, 
is uh, a barrier, but also a blessing. And so I will say to begin one team shifts, right? So we are operating under a, we've always been collaborative all together, but it really is a new process and way of working that is streamlined, it's centralized, it's consistent, it's really clear. And so that um, has definitely been a difference. And I wanna say also is that the marketing team, the social team is getting such an influx of comments on the digital channels that they have absolutely had to restaff and expand their monitoring hours, bring more people in. That is not their primary job function to help and to respond and to do it in a timely manner. And so that has been wonderful, wonderful to see the extremely flexible dynamic of people um, within the organization. And then really the last challenge is not being able to do everything we want to do like that we are also uh, consistently um, bound by who is on site right now and what is their capacity um, we can't just send in our media team every time we can't host on site interviews right we can't lean out of our offices and say you know we're moving quickly on x y and z so that technology of coordination also right takes a little bit of getting used to as well but i would say that even with all of those things you know shed aquarium is extremely responsive uh nimble flexible we really have a strong one shed culture and i think it's based in the passion and the dedication for our mission that we have so thank you for letting me share a little bit Thank you so much. That was an incredible story. I am a very big Wellington fan um, yeah. and I love the way you can't quite work out whether he's interested or shopping for his lunch. Um, <laughs> it's so cute watching him, uh, watching him wander around with his friends. So thank you for sharing that story. Um, so you. next up we have uh, Catherine from the Field Museum to share with us uh, the adventures of Sue. <laughs> Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Um, yes, so I am Catherine Yurek. I'm the social media manager at The Field, which is uh, Chicago's Natural History Museum, right across the street from the shed. We have uh, approaching 40 million objects and specimens, um, and we have uh, 150 scientists doing research on all seven continents, in addition to obviously having tons of exhibitions and uh, fostering a love of the natural world. So if we go to the next slide, I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about how we've been working to keep our uh, visitors engaged during this time. Much like Andrea, on March 13th, we announced that we would be closing for two weeks until March 29th. And uh, we knew it was important to follow up this announcement with messaging about how people could stay engaged with us. Uh, a reminder that even though we were closed, we were still open. So we quickly rounded up uh, several of our digital resources that you see listed here. We're really lucky to have resources that appeal to all ages and are available in many formats. So this included our learning resources, which is um, everything from at-home lesson plans uh, for, for parents, I'm sorry, at-home activities for parents, as well as lesson plans for teachers that ran uh, pre-K through high school. This includes the Brain Scoop, which is a wonderful YouTube channel that our uh, chief curiosity correspondent, Emily Grassley, runs. Uh, our Message Maximo chatbot, which is a way that uh, people can talk to the world's largest dinosaur. And then, of course, reminding people about our blog, which we uh, use to go into some more in-depth science storytelling, and our social media channels, uh, both, of course, the Field Museum, and to the T-Rex, but also reminding people that there were national hashtags happening like um, museum from home. So not just reminding them about our presence, but sort of the entire museum landscape and cultural institution landscape that also had resources. On the next slide, you'll see um, that things changed a little. On March 23rd, uh, we had to announce that we were going to be closed until May 1st. And at this point, uh, the, the severity of the situation, I think, had really sunk in. And we realized that there were going to be some more permanent changes needed to really bring these resources front and center for our audiences. So uh, we, my colleagues on the digital team, updated our homepage 
um, I'm sure like many of you, your webpage is a place for people to land and learn about exhibitions and the in-person visitation experience. Uh, we have now really redesigned our website so that when people land, they are immediately seeing these resources and also opportunities like membership. If you click uh, on the website on the learn more button there, you would go to um, a blog post written by my colleague that's called experience the field at home and that dives into all the resources I just mentioned, but goes even more in depth. We worked with our learning team to really tease out exactly what would be most useful for parents and caregivers and educators in this time. Um, of course, we uh, shared that blog post to our, our social channels and those posts are pinned so people can quickly and easily find them. Uh, we've continued to use all of our channels like member newsletters to get this information out to people. And in addition to putting it out there, we're also looking for feedback. So we're running visitor uh, surveys on our website and on social media to ensure that everything we're pushing out there is actually uh, what people need and are finding useful right now. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that uh, this new time frame really required a new editorial calendar. So on March 13th, when we initially announced our two-week closure, that was unfortunately also the day that we were opening a brand new exhibition called Upsalaga Women and Warriors. I'm sure many of you at cultural institutions had similar um, disappointments or poor timing. Um, and so uh, my sort of editorial calendar for social media was quickly uh, <laughs> rearranged. I had at least two weeks of content planned and that very quickly uh, became not the right thing to be talking about if we weren't welcoming visitors uh, into our museum. So really reworking the calendar to focus more on evergreen content as opposed to events which had been canceled and exhibitions which were no longer as relevant. And we're still talking about exhibitions, of course, but the framing of those has really changed now. Some other ways that we're continuing to engage visitors and followers um, are through the, this idea of edutainment. So Andrea touched on this a little bit, and this has always been uh, a key principle of our social media strategy, this idea that you um, inspire wonder, you inspire humor, before you educate. So this whale post here, this whale's popping up to wish you a whaley great day, some fun, some jokes, before we dive into talking about this uh, behavior of spy hopping. Um, we've also been leaning into the museum community. I'm sure you're aware of the brilliant, vibrant things happening on social media for museums and cultural institutions right now. Um, so if you are, if you are overwhelmed and original content right now is a struggle, lean into all the amazing things already happening. Um, we've seen hashtags like Museum Bouquet, Museum Crush Monday, and so leaning in and participating in these sort of trending hashtags has been great. Um, and also interacting with other museums, um, you know, just seeing the interaction between the shed, the field, and the Adler, which is the planetarium, also right down the street from us. Um, followers have been loving just the comments and the, the, the back and forth between museums. Um, so we've been really leaning into that as well. And then finally, just asking people what they want. I mean, this is social media and that is the joy is that we can be in direct conversation with our followers. So we um, have been doing a thing called the hashtag museum from home request hotline where we just ask people what they wanna see from the museum and we'll send them a tweet back. I think right now it is so important to remember that uh, social media is not a megaphone. When we are doing social media successfully, it is really a telephone and we really want to be involved and part of the conversation and, and listening as much as we are talking. So uh, on the next slide, speaking to getting inspired by the museum community and being part of the conversation. The Sheds, Penguins, Wellington inspired us to let Sue roam. Um, I was sitting on the couch, ooing and aahing over the penguins a few weeks ago, and I don't know if my husband was also inspired or just sick of hearing me talk about it, but he suggested, well, you know, I can put on a tuxedo and go down to the museum and you can film me walking around the field. I was like, wow. 
we don't have living animals, but we do have inflatable T-Rex costumes. And that's sort of how this whole thing was born. I slacked my coworker uh, to make sure this wasn't a terrible idea and we, uh, we gave it a shot. And so we have shared a series of videos definitely influenced by our friends at the shed where Sue has been roaming the museum. And uh, it's been wonderful to see sort of the delight that this has brought people. Uh, we've, I think, had four videos that have gone out now and they have reached uh, all sorts of people. They've had over 1.25 million views and they've had over 232,000 engagements. That obviously doesn't hold a candle to the shed, uh, but when you're competing live with live penguins, I mean, how could you? <laughs> Uh, we've also had um, media mentions in everywhere from CNN to E! News. And so this has been a wonderful opportunity, I think, to bring some levity to the, the current time. It's been an opportunity for fun, but it's also been an opportunity for us to educate um, about dinosaurs and T-Rex, back to that idea of edutainment. Um, you know, when we first shared the post about uh, Sue visiting the penguins in our Hall of Birds, we were able to discuss how uh, birds are in fact modern avian dinosaurs. There was one video where Sue went to try and get a snack out of the vending machine, which allowed us to talk about Sue's teeth. Um, so all, all sorts of opportunity for fun and education. This has also been an opportunity for us to make a soft ask for donations. Our fundraising team has been very careful and strategic about how they're approaching um, our, our members and donors and fans for donations, but we were able to work with them to sort of add another layer um, to, these, to, to this content. Um, so finally, I was asked to um, offer some advice on the next slide. Uh, I will attempt to offer some. Clearly, these are unprecedented times. Uh, we are all at institutions of various sizes, which means we have different resources. And there are some very real logistical barriers um, when it comes to doing social media right now. Things just like having access to your building and collections and exhibitions. So there is in no way do I think there's a one size fits all solution. But I, I do think there are some really key things to keep in mind during this time, which is um, now more than ever being authentic you know that has become such a buzzword but i think really consider what is your unique offering what is that one thing that you can bring to the conversation that no other museum or institution can uh, of course continuing to be part of the conversation engaging your followers but also other cultural institutions i've really been trying to embrace the chaos and let that lead to creativity and all the ideas there are so many ideas right now, and a lot of them are really brilliant, but um, it, it is hard to sort of, I think we all feel like we're sort of drinking from the fire hose. So as much as you can, try and work with your colleagues to put some process into place. And also remember to breathe. Breathing is very important, and I think there is a lot of urgency right now. And I think it's important to remember that we have time, and it's really, uh, now more than ever, we want to emphasize the strategy over the tactics. And um, I think when there are so many ideas, it's easy to jump to the tactical part, but we really want that strategy to inform everything we're doing. Um, and I will always uh, vote for quality over quantity. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was an amazing story. We, uh, by the looks of the comments I'm getting through, have a huge amount of uh, Sue fans out there, and myself included. Um, I am gutted I own one of these dinosaur costumes and I left mine in the office before lockdown, which was a, a rookie era. Um, and uh, I know they've proven very popular uh, for people going to the supermarket uh, in the absence of PPE, there's uh, quite the following of, uh, of dino supermarket shoppers out there. So I'm sad to be missing out on that fun. Um, but thank you so much for, um, for sharing that story with us. Uh, so next up, uh, we have uh, Grace, uh, who's going to take us through uh, Canada's Wonderland and uh, all about roller coasters online. Great, thanks Angie. Can you hear me okay? Hello everybody from Canada. 
I'm so happy to be here and talking about this um, during these very strange times. Uh, for those of you who don't know Canada's Wonderland, we are a 300-acre amusement park just north of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. We've got 17 roller coasters, more than 200 attractions, and a 20-acre water park. Um, we're currently, uh, during this time, this is our off-season, so we're not usually open. Um, however, we, we pride ourselves on being very active on social media all throughout the year, right? regardless of whether we have guests in the park. So um, obviously, we're impacted by all this too. So I'm going to walk you guys through something we did, something fun with our, our roller coaster POVs that we have on YouTube. So we want to jump to the next slide. So two weeks ago, we kicked off our modified content strategy for our digital channels, including social media. And one of the things that we did was we launched this campaign where we invited people to ride our coasters and our thrill rides at home. Uh, it was picked up across social media, shared by parents, schools, teachers, tourism agencies, media covered it. It's been featured on uh, Toronto area morning shows and new casts and all of our major radio stations have mentioned it in their roundup of things to do for people at home. And since launching, it's been the most popular page on our website and our YouTube numbers are through the roof. Um, and the information on that I'll get to in a little bit. But if we want to back up a step, the next slide. So to provide some context, um, as mentioned, this time of year, we're normally closed. Our opening is usually end of April, beginning of May, but due to COVID-19, we've postponed our opening until mid-May. And so despite this being our off season, as mentioned, we, we do work really hard to stay in touch with um, our audiences across social media. And at this time of year, my team is usually um, occupied with messages about um, opening day, the coming season, um, highlighting our events, our, our rides and, and the entertainment that we have coming, as well as sales messaging uh, related to um, different offers we have in our season's passes. Now with COVID and the quarantine rules and everything being turned upside down, obviously all that messaging was off the table. So we didn't want to go dark. We knew keeping up engagement was critical. So we started working on a new content plan. And we did some situa situational analysis uh, rather quickly to help form that. Some of the things that we considered, um, you know, our priority pretty much stayed the same. We wanted to stay relevant and continue to engage in a fun way. Um, our timing was immediate. Um, we felt we had a, a very small window of opportunity. Two weeks ago here, many tourist attractions locally that were open um, weren't closing yet. And as well, there wasn't much being offered yet in terms of virtual experiences. So where that idea was concerned, we really wanted to get out of the gate first. Um, the challenges we were up against, at the end of that week, uh, we were all asked to work from home. So we've had no access to the park um, and we have limited resources. We're a small team. Um, it's pretty much just two of us, myself and my manager, um, who's, who are generating the content for social media and for our digital channels. So despite all that, our audience didn't change. Our key demo has always been parents and moms with young kids. However, their priorities were obviously changing um, very drastically. At that time, um, parents had been home with the kids for March break and the schools were gonna remain closed for another two weeks at least. So we knew parents were very preoccupied with having to find things for their kids to do at home. So on the next slide, based on those parameters, our plan was pretty simple. Um, because of the limited resources, we wanted to go with what was easy, but impactful at the same time. Um, if you need to move quickly, for us, um, as, as has been mentioned, um, reuse, repurpose, use what you've got. Don't reinvent the wheel. Stick to what's been working, but just pivot it in a, a different way. Develop content um, that, that's helpful. Uh, we knew parents were now having to struggle with um, juggling careers and homeschooling. How could we help with that? But how could we also be entertaining? You know, people needed to have a laugh, they wanted a distraction, and they wanted to have some fun together as a family. Um, the other key piece for us was doing something that would motivate user-generated content. You know, everybody has been turning to their devices, to social media, to connect, to share, to vent, you know, and to freak out together <laughs> about all of this. And we wanted to see if we could get in there and find a way that our audience could help generate content and talk about Wonderland with their networks, but have fun doing it at the same time. 
So our, our plan in the beginning, two weeks ago, was to work on a simple article. The first thing we were going to do was a roundup of things to do with the kids at home inspired by Canada's Wonderland. And it was going to include activities like building your dream roller coaster with Lego or household materials, designing your own amusement park. Uh, we created some coloring sheets. And one of the pieces in this article was going to be taking a virtual ride on our roller coasters. Uh, we had all of these assets already available to us because um, we keep our YouTube channel updated with um, the latest point of view videos showing what it's like sitting in the front seat of all these coasters. So we had them uh, readily available. Um, we wanted to make this uh, very user friendly. So we had, you know, um, within the article, lots of um, images. We wanted to include videos. And for the virtual rides, we really wanted to have a great teaser video, not only just showing the point of view videos that we already had on YouTube, but we wanted to give an example of kids actually doing the rides at home and how easy this was so we could um, appeal to people um, who could look at that and think, you know, this actually really does look a lot of fun. Let's get the kids doing this tonight. Um, and we didn't really have any assets that were going to work um, showing kids doing that. And I will be honest, um, I'm not above using my own children for marketing purposes. So that evening I came home and um, got the kids in front of the TV and said, we're going to ride some coasters tonight. And um, I'm fortunate to be a part of our key demographic. I'm a mom with young kids. And um, so I'm, it's, it's easier for me to tap into what's on the minds of our audience. Um, I would advise that if, if any of you find that you have a disconnect because you're not part of your key demo, do whatever you can to reach out and, and, and find out what's on their minds. What are they thinking? What are their priorities? Um, talk to people who are going through that. But um, it was that evening really when I was sitting with my kids and we were doing these coasters. I think we were at it for more than an hour. And it was just, they had so much fun because they're four and seven. And, you know, these are rides that they don't get to normally go on when they're actually at the park. So they just wanted to try one after another after another. And I thought this has to be a bigger thing. So the next day came back and um, we turned virtual rides into its own package. It had its own blog post, um, social media posts, including, including the teaser video featuring my children. And we created customized playlists on YouTube to make it really easy to find the coasters, the thrill rides, the family rides, and we put it out there. It got picked up, uh, shared, media grabbed it the same day, and it just took off. Um, in terms of tracking engagements for this, uh, YouTube has really been what's the platform that's telling the story. Um, I think we've seen um, more than 350% increase in impressions on our YouTube channel over the same time last year. Uh, there's been 13,000 hours of watch time and our average view duration has gone up to about a minute 15. If anybody knows, you know, videos these days, videos are king, but um, people, people jump off usually after what, 10 seconds. So it was great to see people watching these videos straight through. So on the next slide, um, a couple of reasons why we, we believe this worked for us. Um, the first point is we got it out quickly. As mentioned, not a lot of virtual experiences were being offered at attractions here in Toronto, and we were offering something that a lot of people hadn't seen before. Uh, we also made it really easy for parents to understand, easy for them to share and to ride the coasters at home with their kids. They, they saw the examples of how it worked. Um, so they were easy to, it was easy to just go through the step-by-step -step guide and link to our YouTube playlists. Um, we also had an engaging package to offer. So we were connecting with the needs of parents who were scrambling for things to do with the kids and we tied it up with the blog post and an exciting video. Um, I think if we had featured a still image or a photograph, we wouldn't have seen um, the same engagement and pickup. And all that in turn made it really easy for media. Yeah. I always try to appreciate that, you know, media are working with limited resources and they're trying to move quickly as well. So um, we try to put things together so they have everything they need to run with the story. I didn't get any queries or questions about this because they already had all the videos on YouTube. Um, most of the newsrooms we work with already have high res um, versions of these videos um, accessible to them and they had the blog as a back backgrounder so they were it was easy for them to just pick it up. I will say though the biggest key to our success if you want to go to the next slide was all of our user generated content. People were actually trying out the virtual coasters they were sharing it with their friends who then tried it with their kids and then they were sharing it 
And that really helped us keep the momentum going. Um, so for a team of two who, you know, has no access to the park and we really only had, um, you know, all the assets that we've built over the years, this was great to see people creating their own content with our videos. And so it served as new content for us and also for the media. So to wrap up on the last slide, since then, um, we've grown our resource library of things to do at home. Again, reusing and repurposing and looking for opportunities to build out new SEO opportunities. The, the original things to do article that we did, we've since you know, pulled that apart and created individual articles for each of those activities. So it increases the chances that if people are searching for these things, they may find it at our site. Uh, we've pulled our resources and brainstormed new ideas with our sister parks across Cedar Fair. And um, we've deployed all this new content across our various digital channels. We've also worked to build on the success of the virtual experiences and looking for new opportunities to do that in different ways and continuing to foster that ever important user generated content. I think we all find ourselves in these difficult times, but um, we've got a great opportunity for some creativity and collaboration. And um, I think for that, uh, it's, it's been a little bit fun. Thank you so much, Grace. I know uh, how I'm going to spend my uh, Friday night. <laughs> and so I have a bunch of questions for everyone. And do keep your questions rolling in. There is a Q&A facility in the app there. And my first one, I'll head uh, over to Andrea first. Um, and uh, before I ask you a question, I, I just have to say there is a lot of comments coming in online from people calling for Wellington and Sue to meet. Um, so that, that friendly neighborhood uh, rivalry is certainly very popular. And a suggestion that they might have a Zoom meeting between Wellington and Sue uh, to practice uh, physical but not social distancing. Um, so uh, that did sound like a, a very cute idea. Um, so the first question for you, um, uh, somebody's asked here, how did the animal care team react to being asked to be part of the marketing efforts as a side gig? They are absolutely on board 100% from the beginning. Uh, there is a great, tremendous amount of pride um, from caretakers of what they do uh, day in and day out. And part of that passion and working at SHED is being able to share it with others. So I would say is that um, if anything, it is uh, fantastic for morale and also a way of feeling that they are contributing in a greater way. So no resistance at all. And I know we were just talking before this webinar started about how essentially we've gone from like social media marketing communications into crisis communications. How has that changed how you are all working together as a team? Yeah, so um, we have a very um, specific crisis communication management process uh, at the aquarium. And I think what it really does to sum it up is it uh, streamlines processes, point of contact, point of information, um, the public relations team kind of serves almost as the, the public information officer for the rest of the holistic communication approach to what is um, going on and going out. And so um, in that way, it's just, um, if anything, it puts really strong foundational framework around um, knowing roles, like identifying roles and responsibilities and things like that. And I think much to um, what Catherine was saying is that while we are working and teams are doing all of this amazing content, we are also in the rapid fire urgency response of significant decision making that's going on for staff and operations and things like that. And so for me, um, I think it's, uh, it brings some sort of control to a situation that oftentimes feels like chaos. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Catherine, I know there's a few comments here saying whoever's behind Sue's Twitter account is a genius. So I, I presume that's yourself. And um, so uh, did you need any special permission to break from the norm and um, to be more informal? I know that that human connection is so important right now. Um, was that sort of a conscious decision that you sought from your executive team or did that just happen? Well, you know, we've done, we've never done something to this extent before, but if you look back at our channels, you will see previous, 
previous appearances of the inflatable T-Rex costume. So I think a lot of it was just extending our already established social media voice and sort of mm -hmm. taking it in a sort of new direction. So um, there wasn't anything that I really needed to get permission for other than getting access to the building. And um, I'm very lucky to have the, the trust of my institution. And so, you know, we've also worked really hard to, to report back on some of the, I don't know, wackier ideas we've had on social, some of the, you know, more one-off uh, things to show, like, this isn't just being silly. These, these things work for engagement and report back on those numbers. So I have a great boss that supports and understands the work and his boss is a real advocate of what we do. And so this was just another opportunity to, to show the, the joy of social media and the work that, that can really happen there. Um, so no special permission required. <laughs> It's good to hear. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the solution suite that you use behind the scenes, um, you know, for video editing, organizing your files, um, uh, scheduling things, um, especially, um, we've got a call out there for some of our smaller organizations who are looking for sort of freemium suggestions. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this is obviously so specific to your institution, but I'm fortunate to have access to Sprout Social, which is what we use for all of our reporting and a lot of the listening and monitoring for our communities. Um, I also use Airtable. That is my sort of social media go-to calendar. That's We use that um, across the marketing team, but I use it specifically to, to monitor my editorial calendar. Um, well, I'm trying to think about other, we also use Crowdriff. That's uh, what and Grace might be familiar with that. That's a sort of a crowdsource user generated content content platform. Um, but I think you know if you if you don't have access to these things, if you don't have resources for them, I, I truly would just just Google it because probably there is a, a free or open access uh, piece of software or app out there for your needs. Um, for instance, for doing video editing, I have very limited skills. I use a, an app, I think it's called Video Leap. Um, and it's fairly, it is a paid app, but it's a fairly low cost. And um, I can do everything I need for, for our social platforms there. Thank you, some good tips there. And um, have you been using TikTok at all? We haven't. Uh, I, as part of my quality over quantity, uh, I just think we don't have the, the staff right now to support another platform and we'd rather pour all of, all of what we have into three platforms and do them really well than extend ourselves. But, mm. you know, never know what the future holds. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're all keeping our eye on her. And, and Grace, a couple of questions headed your way. So um, first of all, can you talk about how you measure engagement in the absence of visitors and, um, you know, with essentially all of our visitation being online at the moment, what do those numbers mean to you when you're interpreting them? Sure. So we're watching um, all of our social channels for, um, you know, shares and the likes and the comments um, and all of that traditional engagement, those metrics that you see there. Um, also uh, social referrals to our website. And um, in terms of the content that my team's creating, which is mostly the editorial content. So our blog articles and things we're, we're watching to see, um, you know, views and visits to those pages um, and keeping an eye. I mean, as I mentioned, YouTube was really the, the place where we saw um, the success pickup for this one, because I'm sure as everybody knows with privacy rules, you can only see so much across um, many of the platforms, um, you know, unless, unless somebody's actually mentioning your attraction in their post. Um, so it was great to be able to see YouTube as that end place where everybody was funneling to. If they were using one of our videos, we were able to see that. Um, so certainly the, the view duration um, told us a lot and um, the impression jump um, and just the, the followers that we have on all of our platforms as well. Um, and I will jump in on the, the tools question. Um, we're, we use... Um, Sprout Social as well. And um, we, we make a lot of use of uh, Adobe Spark and um, really the, all the shareable Google applications. Um, our social 
calendars or on Google Sheets and um, also been making use of Microsoft Teams to, in, in terms of keeping connected across our, our marketing team, which has been much needed in these past couple of weeks. Thank you. And, and can you talk a little bit how, um, how this experience has sort of changed, how you will think about and manage and approach engaging visitors online in the future? I think for us, um, certainly that user generated piece um, has meant everything. Uh, wherever we can get people doing things, um, especially just at this time, keeping people having fun and sharing lighter, lighter moments. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for that and taking um, a closer look at all the assets that we, we already have. Um, all those POV videos that we have on YouTube have existed there for, I mean, in some cases um, for a couple of years, but when this was all launched, people were treating it as if we had just revealed them. <laughs> we had just made them available to people and it was all in the packaging and it was all in how we treated them as being a new thing. So again, yeah, just reusing and repurposing your best assets and maybe looking at them in a different way. Thank you. And, and I just want to do a quick round the room and what hashtags has everybody been using and, and what's working, what's not? Um, well, for us, it's, uh, you know, virtual coasters or, you know, just Canada's Wonderland. Um, uh, Happy at Home has been one that we've um, picked up. Um, you know, I think wherever we can uh, reinforce um, the positive as opposed to, you know, there's enough negative out there. We're in the business of fun, all of us. So that's really, that's really our role and nothing's changed there. Andrea, what about for yourselves? Yeah, I was going to say we're actually um, using them sporadically. So it just depends. You know, some of them are ones that we are continuing that we typically use. So if it's a hashtag that's caretaker Tuesdays, or if it's um, a hashtag that is really specific to another organization, um, like so for instance, um, this is one of the less fun things, but we did post um, as part of being a civic partner um, to help encourage people to take the census, right, as part of our civic duties and organization. So then we're using Census 2020. So we're using them sporadically. And then I think as we're part of larger conversations, I will say one of the other ones that is more of a, an internal effort, but we're also using it on social is shed together that even though we are apart, we are still shed together. And so on that hashtag, you can see a lot of posts from employees and what they're working on from home and things like that. So um, as relevant as how we're using them. That's very cool. How about for you, Catherine? Yeah, we've taken a similar approach, uh, definitely joining a lot of national hashtags, as I mentioned. So a lot of our resources are under the hashtag museum from home. Um, been participating in some of the larger museum hashtags that I mentioned, like Museum Bouquet and Museum Crush Monday. Uh, but then we've done a few other things where we've either pulled those hashtags in for like our request hotline, or we've uh, started a thing where our, uh, our large dinosaur, Maximo, who's uh, the 122-foot titanosaur in our main hall, has uh, taken to rating dinosaurs. So we have a hashtag mm -hmm. dino rates where we're asking people to submit their photos of dinosaurs and um, that's sort of its own separate campaign. So a mix of joining the conversation and then uh, field owned hashtags as well. Very cool. And we've probably got time for one last question around the room and um, Catherine, perhaps you can start us off. I'm just curious about sort of how many posts you're scheduling a day and how do you triage what you call that fire hose of ideas? Yeah, uh, we typically, I post once to Facebook and Instagram a day and several times to Twitter. Um, and typically I only uh, share out content during the week and reserve the weekends for more of the community management. Um, during this time, because we've really been prioritizing engagement and this and social is a, a key way for us to be in communication with our visitors, we are posting on the weekends as well. Um, so that's sort of the, the frequency question. As far as managing the fire hose, um, I am lucky to have some amazing colleagues that are working on sort of 
realigning the, the workflows and the processes that we have and working with our internal partners that are in other departments of the museum to sort of streamline the request and the ideas and prioritize them so that we can figure out, okay, week one, week two, a month out from now, how are we going to prioritize and execute on these various ideas? And how about for you, uh, Andrea? How many uh, sort of posts are you scheduling a day mm -hmm. at the moment? Yeah, so um, the team has definitely upped the amount of what they typically do. I think you could see uh, on Twitter up to um, as many as four a day, you know, a couple on Facebook and on Instagram. I think the um, thing is some of our posts have like multiple um, posts that are part of it as well. So our conservation team went out as part of their research and did um, a full amazing amphibian symphony recording of the vocalizations going on. And so sometimes some of those posts take two uh, instead of one, but we've definitely been really flexible in upping it. I will say too, is that our planning schedule um, starts one week in advance. So for instance, this Monday will be the full um, content planning team discussing the next week's schedule of content. Um, and so that's been working really well for us. Mm, and the same for you, Grace? We're actually, we're posting uh, on a regular posts probably every other day at this point, but uh, more frequently with our stories on Instagram and Facebook. Um, yeah, it's no rhyme or reason to that. I think it's, uh, we usually, while, while the, the park is open, um, we're, we're much more frequent. So again, because this is usually our off season, um, we don't want to flood the social platforms with too much coaster mm -hmm. content at this point. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So uh, for everybody, we will be distributing, recording and slides along with other resources following today's session. You can also check these and more out online at www.dexhibit.com forward slash COVID-19. So keep those requests or offers coming for what you'd like to hear more about. We've got some great topics coming up next week in this continuing series on leading in crisis. And don't forget to join the Facebook group as well. Uh, that's for visitor attractions coming together during COVID-19. You'll find that link on our website too. Well, that's it for us for today, folks. Thank you to our amazing speakers for sharing these very cool stories with us. Uh, to Wellington Sue and Friends for teaching the world how to stay at home. And uh, to all of you for doing just that and joining us here today instead. So stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Namahi.